So this is very exciting for me. Um, I've been talking about the uh, my NFT vending machine all day. And full disclosure, uh, so I am Angela Dalton, CEO and founder of Signum Growth Capital. We invest and advise at the intersection of gaming meets Web3. Uh, and my background is very traditional gaming. In 2016, I was inspired by Tim Sweeney of Epic Games. In um, 2018, highly inspired through a connection here, actually, in meeting William Enterkin, the lead author of the ERC 721 standard, and the um, unlocking power that NFTs could have in games, mainly because um, it's you know kind of merging onto the highway of what gamers have been doing for decades, which is buying, selling, and trading assets. So, um, and uh, I'm on the board currently on the board of Phase Clan, uh, which is the largest esports company, and um, I'm also importantly an advisor and an, and an investor in um, my NFT, uh, Hugo McDonough's company. So I'll turn it over to, to, to Hugo. Oh, thanks for that, Angie. Um, so my name's Hugo, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of, uh, of uh, MyNFT.com, but also two other projects in the space, something called Cryptograph that we started back in 2018, and um, an auction system that we've invented called GBM, um, which is a very interesting uh, auction that mechanic that creates the incentive to bid, so you get a lot more participation in, uh, in your auctions because the only two outcomes are bidders either make money or they win the asset, which creates really interesting price discovery. Um, and we're launching a new multi-chain marketplace for NFTs um, that's sort of really natively multi-chain. Um, uh, and the beta should hopefully be coming out next week. Um, so that's a bit about sort of what we're up to in the space. And personally, I've been in crypto now since about 2013. I jumped into NFTs right when it was sort of beginning on Ethereum in 2017, um, but messed around on Counterparty a bit as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I've been, been in the space for a while and um, have been following it obviously very closely. I would love for you to share uh, the story of the three of you coming together because to me that is um, kind of the magic that's, that's, that's hard to replicate. Yeah, so um, I've got two other co-founders, um, two French engineers, uh, a guy called Edouard and Guillaume. Um, we met at Imperial College Business School back in 2014, 2015, and um, we decided that we had to start our own business. Um, we uh, created a, a virtual reality property company back in 2015, way too early. Um, you know, we were running around London with this huge briefcase with a giant computer in it, putting virtual reality headsets on like the head of Savills and being like, this is the future of your marketing. And he was like, I've got nausea. Um, and so that's about as far as we got. Um, but then after about a year of playing around with that proposition, learning what it's like to be too early with the technology, um, we, uh, uh, NFTs just sort of come onto the horizon for us in 2016, 2017. Um, one of my older brothers, a guy called George McDonough, started a, um, uh, an investment company in the space back then called KR1, which is a, a really successful uh, uh, fund. And um, he was a part of the sort of genesis of myself and my two other co-founders coming together and discussing NFTs at the time. And um, one conversation led to another, and we were just like, we have to, we've got to start something in the space. The technology is so exciting. You know, we're big believers in the idea of tokenizing all of the world's non fungible assets. Um, and I really mean that. Like, I think that eventually one day, whether you know it or not, every non fungible asset in the world will have a token to represent its value, or at least its authenticity in some form. Um, and so we want to be a part of that sort of journey. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, would love, you touched on the auction mechanism, but mm. a lot of people ask me about this. Um, and I think that it would be great to dig into exactly what it is and how can you quantify the, the kind of impact that it's had? Sure. So, um, yeah, when we, when we first created our first project back in, in 2018, which was Cryptograph, which were these one of one perpetual digital giving legacies basically made by famous crypto pioneers, famous personality brands, uh, artists. We did a lot of thinking as to how you discover the value for these assets. They're completely unique, they're original, they're, 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 they're made by, they have historical value in, in, imbued in them. So naturally you have to go to an auction um, there are lots of different auction systems out there today. The two most common ones on blockchain are 
the Dutch auction, which is like a reverse auction, um, which is very cheap to do on chain in terms of compute, but it's extremely easy to manipulate um, and front run. And then the other one is the English auction, which is the one that we all know well, which is you know one, two, three, four. You bid four, you win, and the guy who you know lost lost, and 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 you get you get the asset. Um, that has a whole bunch of other problems with it, like uh, um, not attracting enough bidders, leaving a lot of money on the table in terms of price discovery, um, and there's a loser because there's someone who didn't win. So we were looking at all of this, and um, when we were looking at obviously what smart contracts can do and programmable money, you can obviously do a bunch of stuff in the Web3 world that you can't do in the legacy world, and we came up with GBM, which is basically uh, the, well, the, the, the name is just the initials of the surnames of us founders because we're very unoriginal. Um, but basically, in, the, in a GBM auction, the only two outcomes are you either make money or you win the asset. So if you bid, say, 100 on this asset and then someone else bids 200, you'll get your 100 back from the smart contract plus a return. And that return is a variable rate of return depending on how much you outbid the previous person. So you're incentivizing price discovery to occur at a much, much faster rate. Um, and you're incentivizing the market to find the truest market value for it. It's also very, very difficult to, to, to manipulate, and it's very bot resistant because of how, it's, how it works on chain. Um, and so from a sort of system perspective, if you will, the way it sort of works is if you're the final bidder, let's say, and you bid 1,000, the seller will walk away with, say, 800, and 200 has been distributed to everybody in the bidding chain in real time um, at varying incremental rates of return. The parameters and the game theory of this system, you can change you know, minimum step increase per bid or cap the maximum amount of return to make sure that you know, the balance all sort of matches up. But we've, um, we've started integrating it with other partners. The, the big partner that, we, that, that, that integrated it first was um, Avagotchi um, and Jesse and Dan over there played with the auction system first with Cryptograph back in 2017. And when they built their project, they were like, okay, we have to have this for our project. And um, it just, it was a crazy success. I mean, on average, uh, uh, we changed, the auction system changes, changes bottom lines by about 160%. Um, and uh, the big thing for them was in their community, if you've got sort of 50,000 active players and you do a release of like 10,000 assets, 5,000 people might get all the assets, and then you've got 45,000 people in your Discord basically spreading a whole load of FUD. You know, this is a scam, I got rug pulled, this isn't fair. Um, and so when they did their second auction with GBM, um, all the people that didn't win an asset were like, this was, this was amazing, we all made a bit of money, I had fun, like, um, and it changed the overall community experience for them, which was a big, a big thing. It's such a behavioral concept, and yeah. it's, it's, it's so appealing when you're in an auction to right before you hit the button, think, well, at least I'll get something if I don't win. I mean, right. there's a little bit of insurance there that kind of gives you that boost to to, to jump in yeah. and play. And um, and what you're saying is, so so in the you know, let's say thousand dollars and is the pool eight hundred dollars. You know, it, it goes to the winner. Two hundred dollars goes to everybody else. Is that eight hundred dollars more? Yeah. So the the, the eight hundred dollars goes to the seller. The uh, and 200 to the people in the bidding chain. And when you compare it to an English auction, which is the next best uh, uh, auction system, you'll probably sell it for somewhere between 400 and 500 on average. So yep. we're, we're adding usually somewhere between 150 to 200% change in the, in the bottom line for sellers. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's switch gears a little bit to, um, to Cryptograph and, and the evolution of that, and then, and then uh, end with, you know, kind of, or get us to my NFT. Sure. So, um, yeah, when we, when we first started Cryptograph, it was, I mean, there's probably a few hundred people in the world at the time that cared about what NFTs were. Um, when, when was this? This was back in 2017, 2018. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the crypto, when CryptoKitties came out, there was, you know, Active wallets in the space suddenly shot up and then quickly quickly decreased after the initial sort of hype cycle of that project. But um, you know, monthly volumes were you know tens of thousands basically. Um, so it was a very different time. And so what we had to do, a lot of it was all education based. And what we were trying to do was by bringing in these sort of Hollywood personalities into the space, was spread the word about what NFTs are, and you know try and get the next sort of 
early majority on the innovation adoption cycle interested in this technology. And so we went out to, to Hollywood and we did the first, you know, Paris Hilton's first cryptograph, Jason Momoa, Ryan Felipe, all these sorts of uh, 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 personalities. And um, they would tweet out to their, to their followers, um, you know, this is, this is my first NFT, you know, I'm just raising money for this charity, et cetera. And we would get inundated with, with, with DMs from, from thousands and thousands of people being like, oh, I want to be involved. This is really exciting. This sounds really fun. Um, can I pay with my PayPal? And like, well, there's this thing called MetaMask and you've just lost like everyone, like literally 99% drop off. So we, we have experienced with Cryptograph in the early days so many of the teething problems that we're all still talking about today on boarding systems, clunky UX. The auction system, when we first implemented it on Ethereum, was like the gas fees went from sort of 50 cents to place a bid before the, 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 the ICO cycle to $1,500 to place a bid at the height of, um, of, 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 of the madness in 2020. And, um, you know, that just became completely unworkable. So all of these teething problems from having spent so much time in the space has all sort of culminated in what we're releasing in, 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 in beta next week, which is myNFT.com, which is trying to really work on two things, really. One, bring all of the assets that we are yet to see on chain, to come on chain, bring them on chain. So start onboarding new kinds of, uh, uh, of NFT frameworks and assets that will work for things that aren't just, say, digital uh, uh, imagery with different rights attached. And um, the yeah, second part to it is trying to build something that, you know, the early majority, the average Joe can 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 engage with. Um, and uh, uh, as a part of that as well, we have a thesis, we think in, internally that long term, the whole space is going to move more and more multi-chain because chains are going to be easier to spin up. They're going to be easier to create. They're going to, you're going to have specializations for different kinds of chains. The ability for chains to be able to interact with one another is going to be crucial, and so a marketplace, or a you know, even more than a marketplace, a place that is creating the onboarding and the redemption for different kinds of NFTs and the creations of different kinds of NFTs and the trading for them, um, that is built to be natively multi-chain is 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 I think going to be very important, um, and so. Yeah, that's, yeah that's that makes a lot of plan. sense. And, um, you know, we've talked about this in the past, but I think it's really interesting that I was, uh, so in 2018, my first project was to evaluate which blockchain would be the most suitable for AAA games. And I concluded at the time that there wasn't really anything yet uh, that was suitable um, because Ethereum and Bitcoin could, ne could not handle, um, you know, a AAA game. And, uh, and I didn't see it ever really changing uh, at that moment. And then a few months later, I stumbled upon Polkadot and thought, wow, this technology uh, could work in terms of speed and, and the, the purpose of interoperability. And it's interesting to me, we talked about this yesterday, um, how there's this a little bit of a zeitgeisty thing happening with Polkadot where there, there, were, there were several different kind of game-oriented companies that kind of landed also in Polkadot, even though Polkadot doesn't make uh, any sort of a branding, you know, point about gaming or anything kind of mass market. And you found the same thing. And I, I wonder if you could talk about your, you know, ending up on Moonbeam. Yeah, yeah. So we we use a large part of the Polkadot and Moonbeam tech stack. So we're, we're, we're independent, but we leverage a huge amount of their technology. So we built our own sort of side chain or L1, if you will, but it uses Substrate Frontier, which is a mixture of Moonbeam and Polkadot technology. But for us, about, ooh, I don't know, two years ago, two and a bit years ago now, when we were thinking about where we want to build um, the core part of our infrastructure or what tech stack we want to leverage, um, we were thinking long term about where value will naturally aggregate and the network or the protocol that is building the glue between all these networks to communicate with one another is the place that that will naturally occur. Because if you build the roads, you're the forum. And if you're the forum, that's where value will naturally aggregate. And Polkadot was the furthest along in terms of building viable infrastructure that would do that, which excited us a lot. But obviously, the network effects and the first mover advantages of Ethereum 
uh, uh, was something that we also wanted to obviously be a part of and service, and that's why the Moonbeam integration with with with, with Polkadot for us is really really important because it provides that perfect tech stack. Because mm, um, Moonbeam is the um, EVM compatible. Yeah, Moonbeam is one of the yeah is the EVM compatible um, parachain on on Polkadot, and um, we spent a lot of time building a a, a two way bridge for people to move assets between the ecosystems if they wish. Which and this infrastructure these. I'm actually doing a talk on it tomorrow about cross-chain NFTs, but it'll get better and better and better and faster and faster and more secure. At the moment, we're in the first iteration of it, and there's a lot of problems with bridges. Um, but definitely, we're moving into a world where users, gamers, whatever vertical it might be, people selling houses one day via NFTs, they're going to want to be able to move their assets between different networks in a kind of flawless fashion. And that's an extremely complicated thing to do right now, but it's going to become easier. And systems like Polkadot uh, are the very first step in making that a complete reality because of how their, their cross-chain messaging and communications work. Um, and so we want to you know, sort of be you know, at, the, at the forefront of that, which is a large, one of the other large reasons why that tech stack makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you raise a good point, which is that you are vertical agnostic uh, yeah. with, in your um, in the for the MyNFT marketplace, and you've kind of dipped into celebrity life, some very well known musicians, Jeff Buckley's guitar, yeah. um, and then there are other areas that you are exploring. Can you talk about some of these other verticals that might emerge on MyNFT? Yeah, so um, I guess the first one that um, we're going to be sort of pioneering is bringing in Web2 domain names, so traditional domain names, which in many ways are the first NFT asset, and bringing that into a tokenized world. So adding the natural liquidity and friction reduction that a token brings to an asset that right now needs a lot more liquidity, needs better price discovery, uh, you know, 60 days transfer periods of moving domain names, um, very, very poor auction systems, you know, if you want to sell a domain name, it's usually just some people on email being like, "Oh, I'll pay you this or I'll pay you that," and it, it's 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 not very it's not very market driven, uh, 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 or it's not very accurate the information. And um, so we want to totally kind of upend how things are done there by creating the onboarding and the redemption system needed to properly tokenize that kind of asset. And then from there, I guess there's a lot of other things under the hood at the moment, but um, we'll start looking at. Uh, at, at more intangible kinds of kinds of assets and creating systems for people to start monetizing those things via this technology, via NFTs. Great. So we have a couple of minutes left, and I'd love to. You're on. You're on the eve of, or the verge of, a lot of big, exciting changes for the company, including the My NFT for first first vending machine in Europe outside. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit? Give us give us some hints of what's to come. Yeah. So. Um, when we release the, the beta next week, it'll be a place for people to experience GBM, the auction system, for any of the assets on the chains that we support in any of the currencies. So everyone will be able to start engaging with that system and learning about it and having fun with it. And then from there, we want to sort of, we want to, we'll launch the domain name product, which will be really exciting to sh as a, as in many ways, just a case study on how uh, uh, this technology can disrupt different verticals that haven't been looked at yet. And um, then we're going to start, then we want to release our minting infrastructure, which we're spending a lot of time on and is, is very complex because what we really want to do is put the real power of programmable ownership into the hands of an individual who has absolutely no technical or coding expertise, but might be an extremely talented creative or, or, or have a completely different route that wants to utilize this technology for their own and for their own monetization purposes, let's say, or, or community purposes. And um, that's that's going to be a, a, pr a pretty big piece because at the moment, there's a lot of people working on minting. Multi-chain minting is quite complicated, but actually making it simple and easy for people to be able to really use the power of programmable ownership is is, is, is a big thing for us, and that's, that's going to be important. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, so just going back to the early days, of Cryptograph, would love to hear um, kind of most interesting artist experience NFT you guys created. You've, you've there, there have been a lot of really great ones on on your platform. So yeah, I think the first the first Cryptograph ever created, uh, and I guess um, fairly aptly, 
was Vitalik's first ever NFT. So um, obviously we were we were kind of born on Ethereum, and um, he for us was uh, uh, a big inspiration and a big part of our journey. And so getting his NFT was 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 really quite fun. And he drew the quadratic funding formula that he he created with Glenn Whale uh, Radex, which was quite fun. Um, and uh, then a bunch a bunch of others from that space. Um, in the in the kind of grassroots crypto art space, a lot of monies was a lot of fun. His his cryptograph, um, Hexiosis, a lot of the kind of older older guys in the crypto art scene, and then I guess in the sort of traditional celebrity world, um, Kristen Wiggs was really fun when we did that together. She was very funny and and uh, and she did quite an abstract piece. Um, we did uh, uh, obviously. How much did Paris's Paris Hilton did it? She drew her cat. She I drew remember. her cat. Yeah, it was her her cat Munchkin that she drew, um, and it was her. It was really interesting with her because it was her first NFT, uh, uh, but she was one of you know one in ten at the time of people you'd speak to would just like click and be like, okay, I really get this technology. This is really exciting. I want to learn more and sort of go down the rabbit hole. And she was one of them. Um, and uh, it was really, yeah, it was really interesting to see. Good. Well, we're all excited to see what's coming next week. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much, yeah, Hugo. Thanks, Angie. Cheers.